All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another Eternal Remedy session of musings and ramblings and all the gems of and nuggets of wisdom in between. I am very fortunate to be joined by three of our very own. We have Kat in the house, we have Mark, and we have Nicole. And today, we're going to be doing an interesting thing, something we haven't done before. But we're going to reflect on what this year has been like, what 2020 has been like, as if it hasn't been stretched. The cliche hasn't been stretched to the point of breaking that this has been an unprecedented year worth noting, remarking, and dissecting. So we're going to do what the occasion calls for and do fashion and put our eternal remedy lens on what we've been through this year, specifically the lens of plastic artificial, which was our season that we were present in for most of the year. And we're specifically going to be taking apart or diving into our three of our artifacts of artifice, which are a continuation and extension of something we created in our first magazine to remain silent, which was a way for us to encapsulate or provide language for complexities that we go through within our lived experience related to the theme at hand in the magazine. And so we created a body of these that you can find in a spread, but we're going to focus on these for the conversation today. Is there anything I might have missed? Illustrious team. Sounds great. Do it. Okay. 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 So as you can see on the screen there, and for those of you listening in, what we just popped up was the three artifacts. So I'll quickly go through them and read the definition so you have a concept of what they are. But the three of them are beauty, relationships, and corporate work. So we define beauty as a multifaceted experience, one that wears many masks. It's the cause of the rush of pleasure in your senses, the tingling excitement which courses through your veins when faced with the perfect 0.8 ratio. The cascading locks, those glistening, rippling muscles. It's the rush of jealousy when faced with a glowing plastic body. It's the mm -hmm. rush of shame reserved for the moments in front of the mirror where you rotate round and round, sucking in your stomach examining the shock of gray emerging in the root wincing with pain every time you pluck a hair or pinch your own love handle privately so that no one witnesses your self-punishment the same rush of exhilaration that forces you to lather serums of full of promises all over your skin anti-blemish anti-wrinkle antibody Wow, that's a full-ass definition. Before we dive uh, into the next question for you, was did you read that from the screen? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> that, was some, that was some 2020 vision right there. <laughs> oh, I'm struggling. I want you to know that. <laughs> 40, 40. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get through it. So there may or may not be words that um, <laughs> are wrong in the way I defined it. But I think we get the gist. So I'm going to see if I can turn down the music so it's less distracting. But as I look to do that, the first question I want to pose you, and I might chime in on this, is does something need to be authentic for it to be beautiful? Mark, you want to kick us off? No, I do not. <laughs> um, does something have to be authentic for it to be beautiful? Well, I, I think um, to answer that first, we would have to define, you know, what it means to be authentic. And then we would have to define what it means to be beautiful. 
um, a, a definition that I always come back to for authentic is, you know, something that allows, you know, life to grow organically. And we might want to develop that definition further as we go along, but um, I, I think I'll work with that for now. And um, beauty, I think, is... I'll define it as a wonderful glimpse of the transcendent, let's say. And in that sense, if it's a glimpse of the transcendent, it allows, you know, it allows life to grow organically. So in that sense, I would say that, yes, it's something has to be beautiful in order for it to, or something has to be authentic in order for it to be beautiful. Um, based on those two definitions, which of course I, I'm sure we're going to change as we go along. Yeah, I, I'm happy to to build on that because I think I disagree. Mm -hmm. And I think, and it's not that I disagree with your definitions, but more that for for me, authentic is one of those words that doesn't really mean anything anymore um i think it's used just as a, as it's become a buzzword almost to say like this is authentic or i'm living an authentic life or this represents something authentically culturally or this is an expression of my authentic self because there's something about authenticity that implies an origin and it's kind of linking it back to something and so for me, the two concepts just aren't necessarily related. Like one doesn't preclude the other in terms of authenticity and beauty. I think authentic things can be beautiful and inauthentic things can be beautiful in their own way too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's, this is something on. I'm wrestling with. But I don't R think my, res my response, well, I don't know if my response will be as kind of well put together and well versed as Nicole and Marks, but I think I feel closer to the idea of beauty than authenticity in that like, there's a certain like disruption and like we've, we've spoken about this before in the past, haven't we? Like beauties, there's something really beautiful about things that are distorted. I think mm -hmm. like maybe The weekend was like one of the first people to, in, mo in our most recent history to like, kind of bring that idea that there's beauty and the madness in a way that like, you know, came to pop culture. But that idea mm. has been around for such a long time, you know, that like there is beauty in ugliness and there's beauty in pain and there's beauty in, yeah, in the imperfections. So I think when you think about authenticity, you think about something that's well put together, something that's been around for a long time and, you know, has like kind of passed through you know, many generations and still comes out the other end unscathed. And I don't know if the same thing can be applied to something that we consider beautiful. I'm not sure. I, I love that you've thrown in timelines already or the concept of time in this conversation, <laughs> because I think it's, it ties into my reflection on all your points, because what is implied in what you've been saying is that both beauty and authenticity are positive affects. Like they, they are ideals or things we aspire to, but a, a forward moving direction, so to speak. And what's interesting about time here is that I think authenticity might be timeless, but is it fair to say that beauty isn't? And is the difference there something meaningful? Um, he said that um, authenticity might be timeless, but but uh, and beauty is just as timeless. Is that what you're saying? It, it is or it isn't. It, is it, it may isn't. it may have a different relationship to time. In other words, I see. I see. I, I think you said something really interesting in in reflecting <laughs> on like how we each kind of took beauty as this kind of positive manifestation or something almost like wholesome and fulfilling, but in the definition and the way that we've played with it from our like etra point of view, we've actually taken 
the beauty as a form of oppression, almost like a standard of beauty as being something that's wholly inauthentic in, you know, the way that we alter our bodies or freak out about our physique or kind of how it ends up having this like layer of influence that's a little bit more psychic than just, um, you know, something that it, it is adorned in a way and how it kind of seeps deeper and how in, in many cases, like actually what is beautiful could be very inauthentic, especially when it comes to how we wear it on our bodies too. Mm. And is mm. that negative or is it positive or is it just is? You know? mm. That's interesting. Like along the idea of like what you're saying, Nicole, about authenticity, like it's, it doesn't really work. Like authenticity doesn't have a lot of grounding it mm -hmm. wants to believe that it does but as a standalone mm -hmm. it really it really rests on um if we look at like cultural traditions it really rests on the generations before it to kind of give it mm -hmm. its value whereas mm -hmm. you can make something today you can knit a scarf or paint a paint a picture and it doesn't need kind of other elements to give it its value in the same way that maybe authenticity does authenticity mm -hmm. is usually in relation to something rather yeah. than beauty is just it is what it is is what it is you know yeah I think, I think you nailed it I think like, authenticity is one of the most like referential terms mm -hmm. because in here in its own meaning it's saying like it needs to be compared to something inauthentic it needs its opposite in order for mm -hmm. it to be false something beautiful is almost like a standalone it mm -hmm. I think this was like what Mark was saying at the very beginning. It's something that transcends. It doesn't need the references around it in order to be that beautiful thing. Mm. Interesting. But um, could at the same be said of, I, 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 like, so I, I'm struggling to, to, I suppose I'm struggling to understand or to realize if the same thing couldn't be said of authenticity. Because he, um, I think you did mention, Nicole, correctly, that authenticity these days is a term that is so widely used that it has lost its meaning. And I think you're, you're very correct in saying that. But I, I'm wondering if, if we can try to some degree to reestablish a meaning so that we can figure out if we're using it in a proper context, if that makes sense. So that we can like, you know, figure out a way to use it so that we're actually talking about something when we're talking about this seemingly elusive thing of um, which, which we tend to call authenticity. Yeah, and I guess like to that question, just to build on it, it's like who, who has access to authenticity? Like in a way, like who owns the term and mm -hmm. who gets to then apply it who gets to say what is authentic or what isn't for example like I'm Greek do I have more of a leg to stand on to say hey that's authentic Greek food than someone who's visited Greek or has studied Greek do you know what I mean like there's an ownership that's inherent in the term too that makes it really hard to define and really hard to pin down and then also almost mm -hmm. like a little bit um the word controversial as well like what is what is loaded when we say something is authentic that's the thing like what what like how are we using the word what do we actually mean by um by saying that something is authentic i think there's like elemental components like i i was thinking about like for like building a piece of furniture and or like things like laminate flooring if someone turned around and said like you know that's cedar flooring it's like no but there's an actual like material component that needs for that thing to be able to remain authentic so I think when mm -hmm. it comes to like material aspects that has a certain there are certain properties that we have to be able to mm -hmm. that we identify with some things authenticity but I think when it comes to personalities work, when it comes to things like love when it comes to intimacy it was, it's a little bit more abstract and maybe that's not the word that we use mm. when we're speaking about those things because it doesn't have the same kind of frequency. Yes, I, I think um, I think to, to your point, Kat, about frequencies and um, and and just to try to make the, the the term a little bit more abstract. I think 
what, what people mean when, they're, when they describe something as authentic is that it gives them a certain feeling per se. You know, it makes them feel, I don't know, good. You know, so they, they use authenticity to denote that feeling. So I'm wondering what do you guys think about that idea? Authenticity, authenticity, being authentic as, you know, like um, as a stand-in for um, capturing a certain mood or a certain, mm-hmm. certain feeling. Kat got me thinking about the difference between authentic and real. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, you could say like, this is a real hardwood floor, which is an implication of it being an authentic hardwood floor. But to me, there's like a layer to authenticity, which almost like has a value to it. We're adding some sort of inherent, like understanding of its like relative position. So I think the values honest, play is... Mm-hmm. I think the values play is critical here and will be a, a critical undercurrent of the entire discussion. And so if I could bring us back to the focus of beauty and in reflection of our timeline and in the play of values, what do you each think or what have you experienced about the evolution or implication of the concept of beauty in relation to 2020. So let me ask that more simply. What what has 2020 done to change our understanding of beauty? Wow. That's heavy. I know. Hmm. Um do, do you want do you want something that is kind of high level and intellectual or were you asking about um, something a bit more more personal and you know near to home draw from your experience but weave together a philosophy weave together a philosophy i think you've you've given me a task that i'm not fit for <laughs> but <laughs> but I, i'll nevertheless try so it, it, for me 2020 has deepened my I wouldn't say my understanding of beauty but but I think I would say that it has deepened my experience of beauty and um, I've always defined beauty as um, as something that uh, allows you to walk in the walk in the transcendent something that allows you to come outside of yourself and to realize that you know life is somewhat precious and not to be taken for granted. So therefore, in that sense, I think beauty can be said as said to be something that it, an experience of something that is life affirming, let's say. And um, for me, 2020 has given me enough time and enough um, impetus to reflect on what is beautiful in other people. And um, I've learned more or less to see see the best in other people at I wouldn't say at all times, but um, I have learned to try and see the best in other people at all times and to treat them as if they're capable of you know manifesting the best in themselves as I see it, which is which might be a little bit um, narcissistic on my end but um, and like I do fail quite often, you know, but I, I think that's one project I left 2020 with, trying to treat people according to their potential as I see it in my own little narcissistic way. <laughs> Nicole, Kat, do you have a different take on it? I think, I think not super different. I think it's kind of in line. I think for me, 2020, in a way simplified things that um, in a war in a way all of our worlds contracted in almost like in, in a sense of physicality for example like what we had access to and you know our immediate environments and simpler things that might have overlooked before the year took on an end of beauty. And I think it's drawing upon 
um, conception, like things that were never really transcendent to me suddenly became transcendent, beautiful experiences, like walking down a, an empty broken street was suddenly a beautiful thing in a way that it hadn't been for. I, I just want to comment on that quickly before I give you the spotlight, Kat, and say I there's something very meaningful in that point, Be, for me anyhow, in my own experience, because beauty for me had an implicit sense of almost pageantry or grandiosity within it, where it had to be this thing that was above and beyond what you can find in like my mundane daily experience. You know, I wouldn't say that <clears throat> what was in front of me in a given moment was necessarily beautiful. It was that which wasn't in front of me until this year came around and I realized that I need to find a new way to define and develop my relationship to what's in front of me. And it was calling me to dig deeper to find the beauty in that. And my own evolution has been to see what is remarkable in the unspoken, in the forgotten, in the um, unacknowledged. And there has been this different quality of beauty I found anyhow that's a bit more robust and uh, not time bound, I think. So anyways, I, I like that. I, I like that uh, almost calling to home sense that you've been, uh, you both have been touching on. Kat, would you add anything to that? Not really, you know, like that, that last sentence, like what you said about calling to home, like that's, I think probably the, the most, um, yeah that feels closest to home for me. Just this returning to all of these places that yeah, have been forgotten feels like what I've been able to kind of extract from the madness of this year um, that it is. But other than that, yeah, I would kind of agree with both of you. Yeah, what a, what a benevolent thought that is. Like, if you just think about how you spend your time and arrange your day uh, imagining that you don't need to do so much work for that experience of beauty as we used to do like in in 2019 for example it's it's quite present in what you have today I, I feel like that's a remarkably benevolent idea speaking of which speaking of uh benevolence how would you let's let's transition into the next artifact actually the next one is relationships. I'll read the definition and we'll go along a similar line of questioning if that's okay. But the definition or how we define it is the ways we build connections to other people, the uncomfortable urge to find comfort, understanding and romance through another, the intertwining of bodies and souls to form an entity transitioning from the I to the we, accompanied by the burring of one's own needs and the nagging question of what it takes for a self to dissolve completely, unspoken roles and established expectations. Wow, there's a lot in that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, let's continue on, uh, I guess, a similar train of thought. Uh, how have your relationships evolved or changed or the values embedded in them evolved or changed in light of learnings from 2020? Um, I think, um, I think that the answer would be the same as for the answer that I give in regards to beauty. Um, I think I've learned to see, um, or I've tried to learn to see beauty in other people, you know, and, um, 
I think I've I've been trying to operate from that standpoint in terms of the relationships I have and to to hold that as um, to hold treating people as if they're 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 beautiful in and of themselves just for being people as an ideal. Um, of course, I feel feel miserably, but um, but yeah, I think I think I think doing that has made like um, the relationships are like a, a little bit more exciting on my part because there's more inner inner activity now, if that makes sense. So I have. Um, I'm more excited to try my little experiment, I guess, or like my like, like my little experiment of having a relationship, I guess, more than I would be in the past. Can I ask you to dig into what do you mean by interactivity in your relationships? Oh, you mean, no, inner activity. I mean, it, it's the accent. Oh. Okay. It, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, you're fine. It's, you're it's fine. the accent. It it's gets me in trouble activity. all the time. <laughs> I'm no. sorry. Don't be sorry. This is, this one is of the work. things one of the things Mark learned about relationships this year is that they need to understand how he speaks for them to function properly. <laughs> I'm telling you, no. I, like I can't get a girlfriend to save my life. Even if I wear <laughs> nice shoes, still can't. You know. You're just not interactive enough. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> There's no interactivity. So, sorry. Nor nor outer activity for that matter. Stay at home. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> that's not nice. That's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Nicole, sorry, Mark, finish finish your beautiful riff. No, no, that's it. It's just, you know, um you, you know, all right, so so before before you you know how like in relationships something happens and you get pissed off, especially if the relationship is new and like you have all of these expectations about what's supposed to happen and how beautiful it is gonna turn turn out. And of course the person ends up being disappointed, as all people tend to do. And um, previously what I would do is that like I would be disappointed and then I would take my disappoint disappointment and, and I'd walk home walk back to my little corner and do nothing about it. But um, 2020, I think, has taught me to um, to look beyond that, look beyond the disappointment and find people miraculous just for being people. So now when I'm disappointed, um, I still have the urge to walk home, but there is another voice that comes out of that understanding that people are like, um, like, you know, absolute miracles that makes me want to stay a little bit longer and to try and I don't know, for want of a better term, work things out. Yeah, I, I think building off that, in a way, 2020 made me less sensitive about my relationships. Um, I think the, there was the quality of having this like very unique and very vast shared experience and finding a lot of space in compassion and understanding, I think like the level of mental strain that and mental psychic and emotional strain that everyone has been under. And I think having the opportunity to like step outside of myself, I think sometimes, especially in like disagreements or in hurt or in pain, it, I, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, it becomes um, almost a, a way of seeing the world revolving around me. Like this must have to do with me, or this is something that I have done to cause this pain or, you know, and in a way, even whilst our worlds contracted, like I felt like there was a lot more space in my relationships to give other people space and to understand how much just doesn't have to do with me. And, you know, how, how much we all are going through our own unique um, way of processing and handling the world around us. And in a way, like 2020 gave me a vantage point on that, that not that I didn't have before, but it wasn't so clear to me in my like interactions with others. And I think it was also this just like 
wild experience where, you know, even on this call, we're all in like separate places, but we were going through and are continuing in some certain way to go through the same thing. And just like almost seeing how that then interacts with you as a person, but with you as a relationship with you, you know, in context was, was really eye opening. Yeah, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think I um I realized like how many of my relationships were quite vacuous. Um mm -hmm. as a result of kind of needing like external stimulation to give them value. Like do do half of these people that I'm friends with even like me? Like do I even like them? Like what is and then I realized like, yeah, we, there's something really, really brilliant and incredible happening here. And we don't need a coffee shop and we don't need any of these other things. Like these relationships are beautiful as standalones, you know, from across the world. And, you know, that person's staying up until 11 o'clock their time to make an effort, like all of those little kind of things that we would take for granted that really kind of felt quite significant. Um, and yeah, I don't even really remember what your question was, but just on the, <laughs> just on that note, like, I think I realized that there needed to be a lot of adjustments made um, and really kind of seeking out what our needs were like in the different in, like interactions that I've had with people close to me and maybe acquaintances, because everybody was kind of coming to an understanding of what their needs were as the year was going along. So there was this really like, we're all moving in sync in a mad way, but still in sync in our own respective spaces. So I think that was also quite interesting for me. Kat, you said something, which was something I was really reflecting on early on in like quarantine 1.0. It was like, wow, none of my friendships have a soundtrack anymore because you know, you see people in certain spaces and somehow those spaces fill in the gaps, which you don't get on a video call or over the phone. You know, you really need to have things to talk about or you need to have a genuine interest in the other person's life and livelihood in order to kind of engage in those quieter, more like focused moments. And I think like Steph, I think you and I spoke about this at some point where it was like, I really found a lot of meaning in my relationships during this time because I got to know people on like a one on one basis like we had to make the effort to like call each other and find out what's going on and you know not just be like oh, I'll see them in a group or we'll go out for dinner it was like a really conscious effort suddenly and a chosen one to interact yeah I think that's such a such a profoundly powerful angle to to reflect on through this year Going back to what you said, Kat, around attunement in needs, understanding what is present for you, what compulsions you are experiencing, and how they were wished, how they wished you to meet those needs. And I realized that was probably the most present in my relationships. You know, I probably have a need for adventure and exploration and learning, but what I learned about my need with relationships is, is proximity is a part of it. Um, deeper level connection beyond, like Nicole was saying, the soundtrack sort of relationships. And also, also uh, openness. I think I experienced a sense of openness between people that I hadn't found the time or space to bridge that found its way in 2020 because we were so enclosed enclosed within our homes within ourselves within our imaginations of a bright future that openness was a great lever for helping us deal with this and i had conversations with people who I never thought I'd have conversations with that led to places I never thought they'd lead. And I feel enriched from that experience in a way that I hadn't before. And so I think it's, it's not that useful to say that 
our relationships have been bolstered i think we certainly have experienced that to a degree but i think in the way that they've been reinforced has been super important for me just to know that uh, a lot of the disconnect that we i've been feeling or i had been feeling was within my own grasp to bridge and putting openness on the table has been very uh, rewarding for me what was it about the year sorry what do you think it was about it for us like what do you think is there something tangible like was there a moment in the year where we were each of you maybe were like I need to do this thing whether it's to reach out to this person like what was that moment like within yourself where you decided like I need to have a shift in my relationships and how did you approach that Mm -hmm. Just to speak on that quickly, I I think what I realized that changed fundamentally was my grip on control, which is uh, redundant to say my my orientation towards control. I think relationships existed in my imagination and cognitive space in a way that was easy to control in the same way that the future projections of my life were and so for example i could say i'd see my parents or my close friends at this juncture in the road at this point and in this place and that was fixed for me in a way that felt rooted and controlled and the moment i realized that i've lost control of that i realized that i've also in turn lost control of how I was using relationships as a tool to survive. I was like, I don't have this juncture to then re-engage and reconnect with these people. And so I don't know what to do other than to just go ahead and reach out. Like that's all I have in front of me. And so I felt compelled in a way that I don't think I'd I'd felt before in life. It's almost like losing the buffer lost the soundtrack soundtrack <laughs> yeah um, go ahead mark what's on your mind no i was about to tell you to go ahead <laughs> I, I guess and i don't really have something super great to add here i guess for me it wasn't necessarily like a moment that something happened, but I think I kept getting like waves of surprise almost. I felt like a lot of my, I think Kat, you used the word earlier, which has just kind of been like resonating with me. Like if things were vacuous and I think I was surprised by which relationships suddenly, or not even suddenly, like they kind of gained meaning or they gained a lot of comfort or they became very powerful forces in my life in ways that they maybe hadn't been before. And sometimes they were unexpected. Sometimes it was like known, like these are the people that I've been connected with for 20 years. But that, like there was just like so many moments and like tendrils of like wonder and surprise where I was like, I did not expect this to be one of the people that... I reach out to and that shows me this level of care and vice versa and becomes like a rock for me during these times and that was something that I I I I marveled at and I still marvel at I think like it created a bedrock for a relationship that was completely unknown to me um and I think this kind of goes back to everything you have all been saying about like what might have mattered suddenly didn't matter and when that was all stripped away some relationships even if they were like blossoming or new or not really close before kind of had more leg to stand on and that was like continuous moments throughout and still um as we kind of live through this something that you know i've i i try to lean into and i'm also trying to just like let let it happen or let it not happen. I think this goes back to what Steph was saying about control. Like sometimes things aren't meant to be and that's okay too. For reals, for reals, for reals. Uh, Oh, 
Um, like, I guess for me, um, you know, what, what sparked the change was when the, the, um, the supermarkets ran, ran out of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I think, I, I think during this time, uh, so I think two things were going on at the same time with me during this period, and um, one was one was intellectual and quite abstract, and then the other was quite emotional and you know visceral, so to speak. But both of them were separate, but both of them were um, connected at the same time. I think they moved in parallel um, directions, or the uh, the moved side by side parallelly. Um, and I think for me, like I was trying to more or less find an answer to the problem of evil. And, um, you know, um, both in myself and within the world, especially seeing what was going on politically, wherein the president of the United States was telling people not to take the virus seriously while he himself was taking the virus seriously, you know? And um, like, I, I was of the opinion that that potential was latent. It was either um, easily manifested or latent in every individual. And um, I guess, I, I, I guess I just couldn't find a reason. If, if that's the case for me, if, if that was a case, if that was any at all true, uh, I was finding it hard to find a reason to to love and cherish people, and um, and I, I I think I was feeling more or less that you know like if that's the case, why shouldn't I just like take advantage of people and you know do whatever it is that I need to do to survive. But, but for some reason, probably because of upbringing more than anything else, that just didn't sit right with me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was, I was trying to figure out an answer to that. Like, how do I realize that people have this great potential for evil, if, if that's in any at all true? And um, how do I reconcile that with the idea of treating people well and treating people as if they are miracles? And um, in order to do that, I had to I had to return to something myth based, and um, that's how I started seeing this element of beauty that is supposed to be latent in the human consciousness. So that was what sparked it for me. I'm going to do uh, well. Thank you for that, Mark. First, let me say that. But I'm going to do a eternal remedy turn right now and say one thing we haven't spoke about yet in our reflection on relationships is our relationship with ourselves. and the avenue I really want us to go down is how burdensome or how heavy it was for me to have such a close proximity within my, with myself even in relation to other people these sort of conversations where we're open and honest and self-reflective and exploratory are of course healthy and important but they're very <coughs> taxing and honestly uh, made me feel like because I was having so many of them made me feel like the pandemic was more weighty than it actually was and so this is going to, again, be the eternal remedy turn, but I actually started cherishing my more fake, inauthentic relationships. So my relationships with people at work or my relationships with people I do recreational activities like sports or exercise with, I started valuing because they gave me the semblance of not having to deal with all the magnitude of the year all at once. And so the question I want to pose to you all is, is there a value in having fakeness or inauthenticity within relationships? That's interesting because, and I think that maybe we just 
we have like a culture of just replacing and exchanging and interchanging fakeness in whatever material and medium we can. So yeah, going out and seeing a movie or time passing with going into a bar or whatever it might be becomes those conversations that don't have much value. Like literally just kind of replacing one thing with the other without having to come maybe mm. face to face with yourself because of how, again, taxing and um, and difficult and challenging that could be, you know? Mm. I don't really know if you if you did anything, if, if, if you did anything wild by doing that, I think I don't really see that as something that took a different shape necessarily. Like it seems based on what you're describing, it seems kind of on brand with what we would do, mm. you know? I, I think adding that idea of like, that, that idea of supplementation, I never thought of it that way that we suddenly had a lot more blank space to fill and it's like we're sorting through our own archives or our own like availability to then fill that that space to to create some sort of resemblance to what we already know and I think pre-2020 there was a lot of inauthenticity and a lot of welcomed inauthenticity one thing that just building off what Kat said like I really miss is like being in spaces with people I don't know so literally not even just in authentic relationships but like non-existent relationships like there's something about that freedom where I'm in this room of people who don't know me and who give me the space to be anything that I want to be at that moment or to have any sort of elusive manifestation like I miss that and there's something about our more distant relationships which kind of still give that space for performance for kind of like trying on different selves or being different versions of ourselves. And is that enacting in authenticity? Is that fakeness bad? I think it's just part of part of how we move through space and through the world. I would agree and like tack on to that and say that maybe authenticity gives us an opportunity to be beautiful. <laughs> Are you <taking> a circle? <laughs> like maybe. Yeah. Like <laughs> maybe that kind of opens up and I just have this image of like getting dressed up to go to a to a cocktail mm. bar like I just mm. have that very kind of specific mm. image of you know making yourself feel really nice and you're your fakest but you feel yeah. so incredibly seen you feel mm. so incredibly heard you hear about like after 30 years of marriage like she just like goes to a bar and gets picked up by some someone and I just felt the most seen and the most beautiful but maybe the most inauthentic in relation to my life at current yeah I, you so got like, me thinking what's about, that <laughs> yeah you got what's me that? thinking about how you know the people who don't know my baggage and who don't know my history and who see me only in this moment of time might think of me as the, my most beautiful self as opposed to the ones who might have been you know victims of me <laughs> <laughs> and everything I carry with me though you know this is a very those... sorry go ahead Kat. no no I, well I was just gonna say like do those things have to work in opposition with one another like they like that those parts of you can be true all at once you know and I think that's what when we think about love and the idea of like full like explorative real vast deep love we think about a place where authenticity and beauty and fakeness and plastic and all of these things mm -hmm. are allowed to live and breathe and right. exist mm -hmm. i think you brought up an interesting point with relationships because i think the mantra we hear so much about relationships is that for relationships to survive they need compromise and oftentimes compromise within yourself might be an act of inauthenticity, but in the service of the relationship and service of the other, it's actually something very beautiful and something which helps to build something authentic or real. So it's like the two are like in this push pull with each other, but kind of create something completely different. Like I'm gonna tell you all the ways I don't like the way you wash the dishes, but I'm gonna I'm gonna not do that. <laughs> I'm gonna be fake right now and not do that. Like 
just for the sake of us, you know, it's like, yes. and there's something yes. beautiful about that because you're putting yourself aside in that moment and sacrificing and maybe thinking about the other person and being fake, but you're being like real to what you, your needs are or what mm. their needs are. Yeah. True. I think, um, I think Kat just described my relationships and or my relationship in well, last relationship in two ways. Like, yeah, the person didn't like how I washed the dishes, and um, <laughs> and uh, I think if 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 we were to get married, well, we were married, but if after thirty years of marriage, she would have like, you know. You're Jamaican though. How can you you not washing dishes properly feels like a myth. I don't know if I believe that. Well, well, well she was American, so. Okay, that was like you. you. Like, <laughs> been... No, I, in my opinion, I was washing them properly. I, properly, I was washing them perfectly. I've been washing dishes since I was like six. That's know? the point. Yeah. Like, like, like I'm that good, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, she didn't like how I washed the dishes. So like my profound addition to this like part of the conversation. Yes. Did she compromise with you on your dishwashing technique? No, we got a divorce. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> could I could I chime in? Chime right on in. Hey. Hello. Hey, we can hear you. Yes, the yellow box. I'm new to Skype. I'm new to Skype. How do you? Do you know? <laughs> Good thing we're on Zoom then. Yeah, we're on Zoom. Good. Oh yeah, but I'm new. To, I'm new. To, but I just wanted to let you know I'm new to Skype. <laughs> uh, uh, first time caller, long time listener. Um, I, uh, I I I really like the questions Stefan you brought up, and you and I talk about this. I think we've been talking about this all year. Um. And the two, I think, topics are intention and self-awareness uh, when it comes to being plastic. I think, uh, I don't think you can, I don't think it's possible to be uh, plastic if you are aware that you are being fake. Does that make sense? Because that's intentional, mm -hmm. right? Fakeness comes from, for me at least, it comes from like a lack of awareness or the least, at least the way I'm describing in my mind, or I'm thinking about it. And that's interesting. And speaking to like those, I guess, flakier relationships and like finding solace in those, um, that take it took me a lot, it took a lot of self awareness, self work, and like um, knowing myself. Like, you know, a guy from Toronto, like Drake told me to know myself, and I've taken that very serious this year. Um, and I know what those relationships are and I'm able to compartmentalize and know my boundaries in those relationships and knowing that like this relationship is for this reason. And when I choose to, uh, I guess, open the parameters of them and let people in, it's because I chose to do so, you know? And then you, you realize you actually have choice in these relationships, you have choice in how you navigate the world. And going to Kat's mm -hmm. uh, example around um, going to a cocktail bar, the way I think about, like, if I was to go out right now, like, if I got the opportunity to, like, dress up in a suit, like, I love it. It makes me feel good, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I also know the social dynamic around, like, dressing in a suit. Like, does that make sense? Like, people see you, you look good, people see you and respect you more. And, or at least that's how I'm perceiving the clothes I'm putting on. And like, that's what I want to posture. You know, that's what I want to project. And so it's very intentional. So when I go out and people see me and I feel like I'm, I'm getting what I'm putting out. And I didn't think this way last year because I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't faced. I didn't have to face myself in all moments. And so what 2020 has forced me to do is sit with me and ask myself just like the biggest question, why? And like for all things, for everything. And I think about even Mark's example uh, about washing dishes and asserting that there is a right way to wash dishes. And the idea that, you know what, uh, even like to bring Kat's notion in that 
I'm going to let you wash dishes the way because I don't need to like say that this is the right way and I'm going to like pretend. Because there is no right, there is no right way. You know, like we assume that we know what is right versus what is wrong versus what is my preference and what is your preference. And the negotiating is how we build the relationship. Does it make sense? Like letting go of control or letting go of uh, the idea or the sense of being right and allowing compromise to fill and like build a place where we trust each other to make decisions or we trust each other to, with our vulnerability around like, this is something I actually despise. And can you hear that? Can I say that? And if you're like, and I know the most conversations that I've been in uh, with Selena and, those of you doing our sleeves, sleeves, my girlfriend, and saying, I don't like this. You know how it takes so much for me, at least courage being very agreeable to be like, that's a problem. And her to be like, what? I have to, I'm like, no, I don't like it. And uh, I just need to let you know because I just thought you needed to know. And on her end as well, self awareness, like, does, does she feel attacked or am I proposing a new idea into the? into the environment now. And like, now there's a conf there's another idea that conflicts with her, I guess, uh, idea of what washing dishes means. And now we have to balance what that means. But the biggest idea for me is just like, how close to my chest do I wanna hold this? <laughs> like in terms of my self-awareness. And is it actually, am I, Am I actually being fake? Like, is the, uh, like, she brought in fake, like Kat said, I'm being fake by not saying anything, but like, am I actually being fake? Or am I just, cr am I building resentment within myself while not expressing it? Or do I have the self-awareness to know that this actually isn't a big deal for me and I'm gonna let it slide or I'm gonna let it go. It's not even letting it slide. I'm gonna let it go. And as we continue down this rabbit hole, it's like, is it self-awareness or is it intention? And that's how I'm viewing your question right now in terms of the plasticity, because you could, you could see yourself putting on a mask and be like this. And like, you could say like, this is plastic because I am intentionally posturing something that is not myself. Mm. But is that inauthentic or is because I think this, at least for me, the smartest people would know that, I know how you're going to react to something. So I'm choosing to do something that I know you would respond to, if that makes sense. So if I, instead of trying to change your mind or in, instead of trying to be myself and get you, get whatever I want, I'm actually just being smarter and doing what I know you like mm. and getting it. But I'm also, I, think I, I know who I am. So like, I'm not, I don't have to change. I don't have to pretend like I know who I am. So I'm okay to be whatever you need me to be because I know who I am. I, I think it's so important, the exercise that we've all been doing and Evan's been hammering home in making the question itself muddy and not easy to answer because the muddiness is the nuance and complexity of very, uh, very, variant lives and lived experiences. We are so different in how we've gone about our genealogy of values and behaviors that things are not as simple as fake, real, plastic, authentic, uh, authentic organic, and- uh, Authentic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Autistic. Oh, no. autistic or uh, <laughs> empathetic um, and the point is that they have uh, spectrums and one of the things this is a Zizek idea let me cite my sources one of the things he says I think is super pertinent to this line of thinking is that being a thing is is not in opposition of the thing that it is not, it's constituted in the thing that is not. So I'll give you an example. Being real isn't something different from being fake. Being real is wrapped up into being fake. The two, 
the two can't exist without each other. They're intertwined. And in fact, they define each other. And so you, you aren't the thing without the other thing. And I think that's very important for us to hold as a reflection in 2020, where we are looking for ways to root ourselves in the world because we've been unmoored, we've been unhinged in a way that we haven't experienced before, that this new feeling that feels like it's uh, contrary to or in opposition to what we used to feel is not something that's acting against it. It's something that's constituting it. And so allowing that that openness in our self-definitions, whatever that is. And if we think about the relationship as another institution, same thing, Open, opening it up to allowing the opposite to constitute as well, I think is a very enlightening thought for me anyhow. Let's... Just one turn. point, Stefan, one, just one okay. more point. I think, mm -hmm. I think that sounds really good, really nice, but I think it, it's just too much for a marriage. Does that make sense? So it's just, yes. Like, so if you have a girlfriend, you can do that. But like in a marriage, that that just doesn't work. <laughs> you, yeah. you need one right answer is what you're saying. Use your little man's. Like, it should be mine. <laughs> but anyways. Um, <laughs> let's, let's land on our final artifact because this is as good a place as any to transition in corporate work. So I'm going to read the definition and pose a question, but I want us to hold the progress we've made in this conversation thus far in, def in answering or in reflecting on this one. So the definition is a repetitive nine to five of dreaded monotony with transactional exchanges between colleagues and the click, click, click of a mouse and keyboard, the swooshing of emails and yet another forced smile. This all coupled with the suppression of that little tremble in your voice as you stand up in front of a sea of ice blue eyes and bald white heads to deliver words accompanied by beautiful PowerPoint slides. There's irony here. Here is a life punctuated by the shrill ring of an alarm clock and days without promise of reprieve, time sold and forever lost. So... <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, a lot to unpack there. My first question to you all is, how do you manage to stay true and to have your voice or to voice yourself in a way that feels authentic in your workplace, however you define that this year? Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> mm -hmm. So how do you find your true voice or show up in a way that feels authentic in your workplace, however you define that this year in 2020? Mm. I, and I want, I, there's a reason why I said in reflection of what we just said, because we could get incredibly ironic here if we don't. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to take this one for our first class, um, for me, I had to break down work. So I think even in this definition of corporate work, it it's like an ecosystem. It's like everything within it has this like negative hue or this this feeling of being removed from oneself. But you know, work is actually in many cases a set of discrete tasks and discrete relationships and moments in a day. And so for me to kind of find trueness was almost to identify what is it within these moments and these pockets that I find enjoyment in, or I find truth in, or I find, you know, gratitude in, um, and kind of removing them from like, the bigger picture of like, oh, I'm selling the only time that I have for what, you know, kind of like the symbolism of, of corporate the corporation or of work itself. So it's like, oh, I enjoy, I don't know, being busy. And so right now having like a PowerPoint presentation, which I hate doing, I'm grateful for, or having a design, like thinking of how to present information to someone so that they digest it, enjoying that in this moment feels true. So it was like this notion of like 
taking out the whole and breaking it into its like smaller parts and thinking of it in that way gave me a lot of sanity this year and just generally in the concept of work, I think. Uh, chat. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm maybe the, well, no, Mark as well, but yeah, I don't work in the corporate world. So for me, it was interesting as someone who works in the arts and freelance rights to experience like very heavy elements of corporate culture being injected into those spaces as a way to kind of um, create like an extra level of value during the pandemic. So I think that was also like kind of interesting. I felt even more corporate. It's like hopping on a call with another creative. It's like, no, 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 let's get on a Zoom. It's like, and where you might just go to a coffee shop and have a loose chat with this person and everything is super whimsical and nobody can get their shit together. And then all of a sudden we have a slideshow and I'm like, jolted into this corporate world it is these lives are supposed to be in kind of opposition with one another it's the underground and the overground isn't it it's like <laughs> yeah like yeah we're artists yeah but then it's like no there are like real kind of tangible benefits of the corporate work mm. structure that can be implemented into other areas and so I think my my maybe prior aversions to that lifestyle didn't necessarily hold as true. There were elements mm. of benefit that I was able to take and use in my own life in creating more structure, more discipline, more clarity, um, more flow. And I would go further to say that like the more of that type of like life work in my in my own um, schedule actually created a lot more freedom for me to be able to create and to work and to to kind of breathe like the more structure was actually the better mm. um yeah um i guess in, re in relation to your question um i so i don't work in a corporate sector sector i've done like a few freelance jobs you know nothing too major but mostly i just drive for uber and I, it's interesting what you just said about structure cap because I think that's that's a part of um, corporate life that I do miss. You know, like having a structure, knowing exactly when to eat, knowing exactly when to go to bed, and knowing exactly what you're going to do for the day for the next five days. You know, and so I do I do miss that part of corporate life, and I do miss having people to talk face to face to while working on a project together. Um, so like, I, I think I've tried to implement a little bit more of that, like, um, during, during 2020, again, I failed miserably, but, uh, I've been coming to the realization that I do miss that, I do miss having a structure. The, the only thing I don't miss about corporate America is the totalitarian structure. But other than that, I think it's, it's a quite, um, it's a quite, productive environment to get things done in. Very cool. And if I can throw in one more question on this artifact, it'd be the one I guess we can again reflect on our earlier answers to answer, <clears throat> but it would be how is authenticity reflected in your work? By the way, Shauna, you're only allowed to answer this if it's a resounding in every way possible. <laughs> Hi, Shauna. Hi. I, <laughs> I honestly think that authenticity is reflected in my work in every way possible because it has to be when you're doing creative work. Sorry, it's really loud here. Um, but yeah, it, I, if you're not being authentic in your career, I guess part in creative work, you are working for a client. So at times maybe you are swayed based on what they want, but at the end of the day, you're the one making it. So it's still authentic to you. Mm. Every way possible for me. Yeah, I, Shauna, building on that, I, I'm almost thinking a lot about what Evan was saying earlier about like the suit, like putting on the suit 
is a performance, but in its own way, like when you know what that performance is, it becomes a very powerful performance. And in your awareness of that, is that then inauthentic? And so I'm thinking about that from like extending it to the work space. Like I have like a work performance, like I've got a person who shows up to work and who does the nine to five and who kind of like shits on it, but also like wants to do really well in it. And that's like the version of myself that I've created in that space. And so whilst it's might not be the version that I bring to other spaces, like there it's authentic. And that's just what I have within those bounds. And that makes sense to me. I have a quick question like do we actually believe in the idea of a whole self like when we say things like a version of ourselves like do we actually believe that that exists I don't know if the sum equals the parts you know so Mm -hmm. or that the parts are discrete in any sort of way yeah yeah because we're because I think when we're referencing like our whole selves or we're saying like different versions we're kind of referencing like these pieces that are then put together to form a thing that kind of holds balance and holds weight but I'm wondering if and that the the whole idea of time like I'm wondering if if any of this exists and if it's just mythical like if the idea of a whole self is actually even a real thing I think it's mythical yeah. <laughs> I, I might go as far as to say as I don't need that idea to understand or to break myself down into pieces of me. It, it doesn't have to lead into something. I just know it's not complete. It's yeah. a part of me. And so yeah. not necessarily a pie, but it's a piece of a pie. I would I like to think of this question uh, or maybe reframe it uh, as instead of pieces of myself, I see it more as like a chameleon. Do you mean like you have characters you can posture? Uh, and, I, and I think all of us here can relate to this. And a, a friend of mine was talking about um, what it looks like at work and how you have to bring a certain self to like the corporate world because of, not because it's corporate, but because of the characters who are in the corporate world. And these are specifically like um, straight white women that um, that work at Lululemon. Like you have a very specific like archetype that work there. And like my friend and I, we he's like this big black guy who has lived in Canada. He plays hockey, but like there's also like there's aspects of himself that and like even when it comes to uh, vernacular or like just slight, like you cannot bring that forward. And I have to uh, articulate myself or I have to uh, uh, just speak their language. And like, is that a different part of me or is that just a different version of me? And like, how do we define that? Because we do this in all uh, places and spaces. Like I show up differently to my dad than I would show up to, to this conversation with all of you. And the same way, I, sh- I am very silly when I'm with Selena. Like I'm just like, just like over the top. And like, sometimes I'm like, who is this person? But I feel so safe in that place. Do you mean like, and is it a different version of myself? Is it, a, or is it a different piece? Or am I someone who is like, Stefan would like to say, like, am, are, we, are we beginning to see that we are more complicated? And as we go through time and become more self-aware, we become to see that we are bigger than these boxes that we've created. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's how I see this question that Kat's posed. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, I guess, um, oh, sorry, sorry, Nicole, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 I was, I was just agreeing, but also thinking about in Evan's complexity or in like in Kat's question, like part of the version of ourselves is like our response to the rules or the situation or this. So it's like, in no sense, we're always incomplete because we're always in response to an environment mm-hmm. in a way. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to uh, segue into, back into Stefan's question around how do you, how do you, sh- was it, how do you show up most authentically in the workplace, basically? 
I'm take riff off that one. Okay, great. I feel like you don't remember your question. Uh, and, Let's go for it. Uh, I want to say I, I've I found the most success this year, or maybe not even success. I found myself controlling the frame. Like I know that I can change the frame. You know, and like, what does work mean? And this idea that I've I've really fallen in love with this year has been um, human beings. We see meaning first, and then we see objects second. Um, and you know, like before this year, I was just seeing like work as work, and I'm like, I just don't like it because I don't like these specific things. And as I've gone forward, you start to see like I've created meaning around what this work means and how it's perhaps below me. I could be doing better things. And like, it's, you start to see like, it has nothing to do with the actual work and it has everything to do with what I make this work mean. And I have gotten comfortable with knowing what I want and that this work that I'm doing is a, it's almost a means to an end or it's a, it's a, it's, it's a way for me to express what I want and like, it's, it's, it's on the journey in mm. terms of time. You know, I'm here now, so I might as well be gr- grateful and enjoy it now. And if I don't like it, then plan to f- plan an exit point, you know, uh, an off ramp to know where I want to go. And the first thing I thought about when I heard you define the corporate work was just someone who feels stuck you know, and they don't, and they don't know why they're stuck. They don't know why they're there. They don't know what they're doing. You know, this is something that they've been thrusted upon them or they're buying into someone else's narrative and of success. And I feel like as I continue to get older and especially this year, just going back to my original theme from the last um, pillar, just intention and self-awareness. Like once you become aware of why you are doing what you're doing and you have the intentions to do what you want to do. Like there is no, uh, there is, there's no work that is too mundane, you know, you, and and you start to show, you start to gravitate towards the things that uh, you liked, you like the most, uh, or you start to express yourself authentically in the places that you, um, in the areas that the areas that are easiest, I don't, I'm, I'm sure you can take what I'm trying to put down, but uh, I just think of myself, like there's so much, there's so much space for me to talk about these type of conversations that we're having right now at work now, because I know where I can put my effort and in, into that work, like in like finding it in training or like uh, creating or like emailing DNI or, our idea team and be like, this is the type of work I want to do. How can we implement it into the, the areas we are in now? And like everything else just becomes secondary. And my primary focus and like why I like showing up is to talk about this at work. Right. And like now work is this thing where I'm like, I get to, sh- I get to share rather than I have to share. And it's, it's all in for me, at least controlling my frame and knowing that right now there's not a lot of options for me to like change careers at least the kind of steps I want to take that, or that I'm comfortable taking. And I feel okay where I am because of, I feel that, that power in terms of how I can control how I view what I'm doing rather than feeling controlled by the environment. That was long-winded. It's interesting that work is now a place where we can look for realness and authenticity. Like work has really changed form and place in the past like 20 years. Like Mm. so many of our parents worked a job and worked it for 40 years. And the idea that you could look for meaning and realness and authenticity in those spaces wasn't an option. It wasn't something that was even a consideration because work wasn't for that purpose. Even with marriage, like marriage was never about love. Like, and so that's crazy as well. Like that was about financial transaction and and financial support. And now it's about finding a life partner and work is now about purpose and value. And like, it's just crazy to think that all of these 
mundane things are now being being given the opportunity to have life. I, I, I think I, I think it's a certain type of work. I think for you smart people, it's like um you know more of being a place more of being in a place or position to make executive decisions and use your creativity fully. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. So like in that sense, you know, you feel alive and you feel like you have some sort of purpose because you're, you know, you're expressing at least in some degree a part of your humanity. Um, mm-hmm. I still think for a lot of people that is not the case and that will never be the case. But um, but but to to your to to your um to your collective points, I do believe that you can bring yourself to work, if that makes sense. You can bring your, I don't know. I I think there's something to be said for having like a lively imagination at work, even if you're just like stuck in shelves for like 50 hours a week, you know, you can turn it into a game or something like that. Um, I I think um, I, I, I was making this point earlier and I think I've made it poorly I think there's something to be said for the capitalist structure or the, the corporate structure um, to be to be um, to to keep on on brand. I think there's something to be said for the corporate structure. Um, nevertheless, I do. I, I, I'm I'm wondering if I'm wondering if there's an inherent problem in it. In, in the way we're made to work itself. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I, I guess, yeah. Can we, can we save this for our discussion on another date? We're already Sorry. an hour and a half in. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's a, a good place for us to continue a podcast in another session, especially given the themes that we have coming up. And let's <laughs> take this as a point to turn the corner and run our final lap. Is there any final comments that we want to leave in this space specifically in relation to corporate work before I pose the very last question. I have a question which we can hold on to but I want to ask it before I forget it and in all of this it came to me as like is authenticity a privilege and is it a privilege even more so in work and we don't have to answer that now but even in like the way we were going it just some of the points Mark made made me think of like our demand isn't necessarily a prerequisite. It's a it's a privilege within this structure that we've been given. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think. Sorry, that's go a ahead. Big question. I... Um, no, I was just backing what you're saying up, Stefan. I sound like that's going to be a long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the greatest act of artifice or fakeness is to propose ideology and no practice. And so can we end on tangible, tactical ways of summarizing some of our points above? So I'll kick off so you guys have an example to, to work off of. But there are so many great themes and concepts that each of you brought up in relation to the three artifacts that I have, I've been able to apply to what I've gone through this year, like in 2020, in all three of those um, pillars. And one of the changes in behavior I can imagine myself engaging in is catching myself at the point of resistance or detraction that suggests that I'm not being who I am in a certain behavior or mode of speaking or way of living and asking myself, is this action a part of my journey of self-expression in an indirect way? So is my showing up with my corporate speak or is my being uh, having relationships in fake settings or my very uh, superficial definition of beauty, is that just me trying to express something that is actually true, that is actually consistent of who I am? And what is that thing? And using that as an opportunity to embody my values, live as a complete self. 
and I think I think I'll find rich information there. So my output would be to see life in the resistance, see life in the opportunity, or see life in the suggestion that your body is making when you uh, contradict a certain thing. Anyone else? Yeah. Tactics? I think I think to your first part, to your first point about beauty, I think all of you made this point that like um, you know, if you live small, so to speak, and you know, you're brought back to the moment quite often, then you'll realize that there is um, a certain amount of beauty in everything. Um so I guess I guess for that part, my um my recommendation as abstract as it sounds would be to live small um mm -hmm. for the the second one about relationships i would say it's that if you're married make sure that you wash the dishes the way your wife likes and <laughs> <laughs> i know I, I, I get for the for the for for in terms of relationships i would say that living small again is is definitely um is definitely a potent recommendation you know like find inspiration in like the small acts of kindness that you two like you know might exchange with each other and um try and not take anything for granted because that that is that is actually i think what kills most relationships like just taking like even the taking things for granted even the smallest mm. thing and um and in in terms of corporate work, I would say just not to do it. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, like you know, like even if they're they're as Nicole said quite rightly, I think that even if you don't like, you know, the entirety of the of the situation that you find yourself in, you can do things that you do actually find appealing and you can you know find a life so to speak and find a sense of need in, in doing those small things and as evan said if you if you have your goal set up to where you're looking for something that is beyond the corporate structure if you're working on um if you're working towards something else something more meaningful and you know being in corporate america is a way to actualize that then um, it makes doing corporate work all the more lively as well. So. Nice. I can go just to keep it rolling. Um, two things uh, are coming up for me. Um, the theme I've mentioned a lot is intention. Uh, and the second one is um, like listening. Uh, and specifically listening to yourself. And um, when it comes to intention, it's just with all things, just doing, trying to know why you're doing things and make sure that that is the truest like reflection of what you want to see happen, you know? And I think about this um, in a funny way, referencing Mark's washing the dishes example. And I love, I think we love this example. And it's like, if I was to, if I was to tell my wife, I didn't like something. My intention isn't to like put her down. My intention isn't to start a fight. My intention isn't to uh, just more or less call her out. My intention is being curious around why do you like to wash the dishes the way you like? And what, is, what do you have against the way I wash the dishes, right? Because if that is my intention, and the best solution for me is for us to start a discourse calmly around, this is what I like, this is why I grew up, this is how I did it. What is your, and like, literally, if this is my intention, that, that my actions must follow that. And they must follow the path of my best case scenario for both of us. Uh, and I even think, and leaving that there, not expounding and going to like, say at work, if my intention is, you know what, I need to save $10,000 or I need to save $50,000 by the end of the year. And I don't like my job, but at this point, I don't actually see any other viable options. It's like, I know that work, this job I'm currently in, 
is for me to save this money because I have a larger goal. And it's no longer about the work. It is more, sport, more so about the, my intention of why I'm showing up. And if I have an option, like Mark's, like if I have an option to like get off and do something else, then I would, I'll take it because it's still staying true to my intention of why I'm working in the first place. When it comes to listening to myself, all of my thoughts, all of my self-talk, all of the words that come out of my mouth, really listening to the words I'm saying and ask myself the big question, which is like, why are you thinking these thoughts? Especially, I, I like to think definitely sit in the negative ones around like, this sucks. And I'm like, okay, like, why does it suck? Like, what is it about this situation for you? Does it suck? You know, um, why do you find yourself annoyed? Why do you find yourself agitated? Why do you find, why do you find so much joy in this? You know, like really listening to uh, my emotions and like getting clear on my, getting clear on myself, you know, and gaining more awareness around that. And I feel like the more I'm listening, the more I'm paying attention, the more I can control like very specific situations. You know, like I, find myself agitated when I go into a certain situation. And like, once I know that it's like, it's easier for me to recognize I'm agitated and to be in my intention, be in my intention, you know? Cause like once I'm agitated in the conversation, I'm like, it's totally shut, it's shut down. Like I am going for the throat. I'm like, yo, Nicole, don't look at me like that. You're actually cheesing me right now. Why do you do that? Do you mean like, and it's like the, the sooner I recognize that I'm agitated, I recognize that this is, my intention was never to put you down. And like, I'm far more reactive than I want to be. And I want to be more responsive. And uh, I feel like if I can really just know my surroundings and like know myself and start to listen to the way I respond to things and things that bring me joy, I can be far more present day to day to moment to moment mm -hmm. and not be not thinking outside of moments whether in the future or in the past and I get to decide whether I want to be an authentic version of myself or a fake version of myself uh mm -hmm. yeah. Um, just to, just to add to what you're saying, Evan, um, Selena, if you're listening, it sounds like Evan would make a great husband. So I'm just, just putting that out there. Thank you. That's so funny. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. <laughs> I'm so glad that Nicole, Kat, and Shauna are left because you guys really know how to stretch out an answer. The both of you. <laughs> uh, I, to the point that, could you remind me what the question was? That's deep. It's, so, <laughs> it's all love, though. It's all love. Uh, it's not really a question. What it is is to say, I think the greatest act of inauthenticity is to throw more idealism in the world, more noise and not more signal, more concrete ways of going about daily, weekly uh, tactics to better yourself, to better your, the way you show up in the world. So the prompt is based on what you've learned from today and said today, what are some tips that you might want to give people on how they can live these values in a more embodied way subscribe to the embodied living program <laughs> so funny that you would say that because somehow there's another slide on that coming right next <laughs> it's almost as if you knew Man, subscribe these, these are the tactics and tools i have <laughs> as soon as you get by that paywall you'll get a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> just get 
get collect the money, pay the membership, and all your answers will be here. <laughs> That's where I'm headed. <laughs> You feel me? Like... I have no answers of my own. They're all, you feel they're all me? on the Eternal Webity website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> WW dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shauna, Nicole, anything you would add that's better than Kat's very thoughtful answer? Um, I guess the only thing that... I can think to add is that it's uh, inauthenticity or being unauthentic or plastic is natural and everyone has that experience but then noticing that it doesn't feel right to you is what's most important and then the most authentic thing you can do as a human is to grow and change and learn and as long as you're doing that then you're being authentic to you even if you have moments of inauthenticity. Well, Very nice. well said. Very well said. Nicole, if you don't have anything to interject here, let's close on this slide and say, if you enjoyed this <laughs> and got anything out of this conversation and want more of it, guess what? We have a solution for you. Drum roll. Called, <laughs> 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 called the Embodied Living Program which will be launching come the new year, January time. If you've heard this and are listening to this and have stayed this long, you've definitely earned yourself some free membership. So we want you to hang around for a month or two. And if you really feel so compelled, three, but after that, you got to pay. And we're going to start engaging with you in a really cool, novel way. It's going to be a more philosophical masterclass and a more practical uh, random YouTube video with a philosopher. So everything you needed and wish you had in another forum. We hope through this program, you feel as a more integrated person, you feel like you're showing up in a real way in your body that you're acting out in the world in a way that's consistent with how you see it. All the stuff that we wrestle with every day, we're trying to find good, sustainable programs and solutions for that. And so we're going to cover a whole range of topics, including work, food, fitness, and creative writing. So please stay tuned for that. Join us for that. Sign up for that. We have an email subscriber list where we'll keep you updated but look out for that in the next little while. I want to give a hearty, special, warm season thank you to our excellent speakers today. Features from high and above, ideas from high and above, energies from high and above. I thank you all for providing that and holding that space with us today. I feel like that's as good a place as any to close and sign off. Is there anything else any of you would like to throw in this space before we, we close? Thank you for hosting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Of thank course, you. of course, of course, of course. Thank you all for the sharing ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that my voice is gonna appear so much more crisp than yours will. Really? Like, quick question. Like, will we have any classes about what washing? <laughs> in the food in the food bit okay who's gonna be doing that <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna outsource for that demo that's all i'm saying we'll have a guest speaker for that time yeah yeah the dishwasher, yeah, are, 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 the dishwasher you could just find a husband yeah, you could yeah. just find, find a husband for that oh, all right Welcome find us on Enter your damn find us on the socials <laughs> find us on Instagram <laughs> find us on Twitter find us on Facebook you don't really need handles anymore Just your participant put, ID name in. Followed by put in uh, Eternal Remedy on any of the social media outlets and stay abreast of the conversation we want to hear from you anyway so we're going to stop talking thanks and good night bye